Thanks, Guido. Um, it's great to be here. Um, when I was invited, I expected a small uh, meeting in a room, and instead uh, I'm here addressing the masses, as it were. Um, Ireland, historically, is, is, is a country of emigration rather than immigration. And I, I'm reminded of a story, uh, a true story, about uh, a US academic who set a multiple choice exam in economic history in the 1980s. And one of the questions was, a greenback is A, uh, paper money issued by the Federal Reserve, which technically would have been wrong, uh, B, paper money issued by the US Treasury, which was the right answer, and C was an illegal Irish immigrant. Um, but the shoe now is, is, is on the other foot. Uh, and uh, immigration into Ireland, mostly legal, but by no means all, is, uh, is a, big, a big deal. Um, and you can see that if you compare uh, the number born outside the US, the UK, uh, and Ireland. In 1991, it was like 1% of the population. Uh, and uh, by uh, 1911, it's, 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 as you can see, 10 times that. Uh, so it's new, it's big. Another aspect of the immigration is that it's spread throughout the country. Uh, it's not an urban phenomenon. It's not restricted to uh, Dublin, for example. Uh, the migrants from, are from a, a wide range of uh, countries. Um, the migration is very sensitive to um, economic uh, fluctuations. This is just to show that Irish migration is not just big in terms of Irish history, but it also is very big relative to the rest of Europe. Ireland, in the period between the beginning of the century in 2012, received proportionately more immigrants than anywhere else in Europe. Um, and uh, Spain would be second, and I've distinguished here between all immigration and the immigration of non-nationals only, because you get some return migration and so on by Irish people. Um, the migration, like I say, is very sensitive to uh, economic conditions. And you can see here, it is the main driver of population change in Ireland in recent decades. Um, and uh, you can see that it plummeted with the collapse of the so-called Celtic Tiger in 2008. Um, but now with the rise of the Irish economy again, uh, uh, net emigration is, is virtually uh, zero. Uh, it's also true that at the beginning, the migration tended to be of young adults but if you compare uh, data in the, in the census, then it's, it's clear that uh, some of these, once they found Ireland to their liking, brought their kids with them a few years later. So the, the, the age composition of the non-national population is very different in, for example, 2006 and 2011. Um, it, it's also true that in terms of the impact of the collapse of the economy on emigration on making people leave again, uh, those who came from EU countries were much more likely to leave than people who'd come from further afield. And uh, that is probably because even though uh, their prospects weren't as good in post-Celtic Ireland, they were still much, much better than they would have been in Nigeria or northeastern China or wherever. So they tended to stay, whereas the Poles and immigrants from the Baltic countries were more inclined to not go home, but move on to some other destination where uh, economic opportunities uh, were better. Now, one of the uh, questions that this huge migration raises is, and it's something uh, uh, Tim uh, implicitly hinted at, is why doesn't Ireland, like nearly every other country in Europe, have a Front National or a Lega um, or, you know, a Svensk Democrat? And why, why is there no mass anti-immigrant party in Ireland? And this is something political scientists have written a little bit about. Um, the answer is not clear. One answer that you hear a lot is that the main kind of, if you like, hard left party in Ireland, Sinn Féin, 
is very pro-immigrant and that that, to some extent, has defused the issue politically. The, main, the two main parties are center, center, right, and uh, they n never uh, take on an anti-immigrant stance. We had an election in February, and no party, or indeed no independent candidate, as far as I can see, and I went through the press, raised restricting immigration, uh, restricting asylum seekers as an issue. So that is kind of interesting, and uh, I can think of only two other major countries in Europe uh, that are in the same boat, Spain and Portugal. Uh, it's also true of a smaller country, Cyprus, uh, where um, uh, you know, attitudes actually are, are fairly anti-immigrant, but there is no strong anti-immigrant party, which maybe has to do, and I'll come back to that, with what uh, Tim referred to as uh, the issue of salience. Now, another uh, argument uh, in the Irish case might be to be, you know, kind of blunt and uh, explicit about it is that Irish immigration has tended to be not of Muslims but of Poles. Uh, that may be a factor, but that, I think, also overlooks how heterogeneous Irish immigration has been. You know, uh, over 1% of the population is now Muslim. They, are, they tend to be concentrated uh, in, in Dublin. But you have a very big uh, African, mainly Nigerian, but also South African-born uh, population. And the Asians would be Chinese, Filipinos, and so on. And you know, if you take any of these numbers, they are bigger than all non-British, non-American immigrants in Ireland in uh, 1991. So the, the change is very dramatic. It's something, it's something new. So there is still a bit of a puzzle about why Ireland yet, anyway, doesn't have the equivalent of the Front National or uh, UKIP. Um, you know, is it a matter of time? Maybe. Um, attitudes have been hardening. And you can see that here. This is what we get from the European Social Survey looking at the various uh, waves from one to seven. And uh, you know, whereas attitudes in Europe as a whole have been softening in very recent past, uh, in Ireland, at the outset when the economy was doing very well, they improved and then uh, they uh, plummeted with uh, the economic collapse, and they really have not uh, recovered uh, since. Um, so on the European Social Survey, most, most of the, the facts I'm going to present uh, are based on analysis of the European Social Survey, which uh, will be familiar to a lot of you. It's widely used by people who are interested in attitudes to immigration. And with every new wave, there are new papers. Uh, so expect lots more papers in the next few years once uh, round seven or wave seven is complete. Um, the advantages are that the European Social Survey is very carefully designed. It's very conscientiously carried out. Uh, the number of observations is large. It covers the whole of Europe. Uh, you know, a lot of the questions are, are, are interesting. They're ones, you know, that uh, have a lot of resonance for people who are interested in issues of migration and asylum. Now, there are problems, and I, I will mention, there is the issue of response bias. Will people tell you the truth? Uh, you know, there is evidence uh, that, from Switzerland, for example, that when people vote on the issue of restricting immigration, uh, their attitudes or their, their, their actions are harder than their attitudes as expressed in surveys. So this is an issue. Um, there is also the issue which, again, I, I was hinting at there, of comparing like with like. You know, Irish immigration may be different to German immigration. You know, people may prefer to have lots of Poles than lots of Nigerians. So, uh, you know, when you mention the word migration, it has a different register depending on the country you're talking about. And so th there is an issue there. Then another issue which would worry those of us who are economists is endogeneity. You know, we would like to use these variables to explain each other. 
You know, uh, people are hostile to immigration because they are on the right wing politically or because they are narrow-minded in other ways or that because they are racist. But you could argue that it's the other way around, that it's all the immigration that has made people vote more to the right or become more racist and so on. So I think that is something one has to be aware of in using the European Social Survey. And it probably means that it is better regarded as a descriptive uh, tool or one for light analysis rather than kind of deep, hard analysis. It's very suggestive. And I think, as you'll see, uh, some of the, the results I'm going to describe here um, are uh, interesting. And I think you know, some of them are a bit worrying. Um, and again, uh, Tim and I were working on this separately, but what I'm going to say about Eurobarometer is very much like uh, what, what Tim had to say. There is a sense in which uh, what Eurobarometer has to say about immigration captures how people are going to vote and what they really feel strongly than the ESS. Because if you look at the ESS uh, for Spain, Portugal, and Ireland, people actually are not enthusiastic about immigration any more than in some other places. But on Eurobarometer, emigration is not an issue that bothers them much. It's not in their top three or top five of issues. So, uh, and you, you can see that here, for example, taking Spain, Portugal, and Ireland over a long period. This is what the Eurobarometer has to say about the proportion who list immigration among the the, the two issues that bother them most for their country's sake. And you see in Denmark and the UK and the Netherlands, uh, the percentages have become very high. And that is much closer to how people are voting than what the, the, the difference between these two countries, these two groups of countries, when you look at the ESS, isn't at all as great as when you look at them using uh, Eurobarometer. So these are cautions I would enter uh, in using uh, Eurobarometer. Now, uh, this slide has not come across as clearly as one would like, but um, what you have here is Irish attitudes to uh, immigration in comparative perspective. And what I'm giving you here is the three countries most favorable and least favorable to immigration in uh, round six, which has 29 countries, and then in round seven, which has 14 countries, or 15. And, uh, what you, and the, then these are various questions. You know, countries' culture is undermined by immigrants. Immigration is bad or good for a country's economy, and so on. And what you see there is that the Nordic countries are, by and large, the ones most enthusiastic about immigration, no matter what question you ask. And the ones that are least uh, enthusiastic, they include Cyprus here, Hungary, uh, Portugal in that case, Kazakhstan, and so on. Ireland is in the middle or further down than the middle. So in terms of attitudes, I want to repeat, Ireland does not come across as being in love with uh, immigration. Uh, so this is uh, more of the same. You, this is using round, yeah, this is using round seven now. And you see the countries at the bottom here, Austria, Estonia. The Czech Republic, soon to be Czechia, is the most anti-immigrant of the lot. And um, whereas here, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, again, the, the, the Nordic countries are the most enthusiastic. Now, this is a question which um, is very interesting. Um, it asks, would you be prepared to allow many, not so many, a few or none of Jews in your country? And they ask the same question about Muslims and gypsies, in other words, the Roma. And what you find for Europe as a whole, this is in round seven, is that 8% say no Jews, 29% no gypsies, 
21% no Muslims here. If you look at Ireland then, Ireland is, uh, you know, a little bit worse than the average. But then you look at the best and the worst. And uh, Sweden is, you know, is quite prepared to allow in many Jews, many Muslims, many Gypsies. The Czech Republic, only 2%, less than 2% say yes to many Muslims or many Gypsies. And 19% say no Jews at all. Now, this is a purely hypothetical question because Jews have no recent history of immigration into uh, the Czech Republic, nor are they likely to immigrate into the Czech Republic. So I would see this as a measure of xenophobia, of a kind of a measure of racism, because it's not so much about immigration as it is about some kind of hatred of foreigners. And the contrast between um, the, uh, oops, the Czech Republic and Sweden, Sweden is only 1% there for no Jews, uh, the Czech Republic has, and notice that the Czech Republic has 64% no Roma. Again, you know, you treat those numbers with the caution I expressed about response bias and intensity of feeling and so on, but this is what you get in the European Social Survey. And I find, you know, uh, if anything, you'd, you'd expect people to be a bit cautious about how, answer, how they answer uh, these questions. So they might be a lower bound on kind of resentment uh, against foreigners. Um, this work I'm doing is uh, a collaboration with Kevin Denny, who's a, a colleague of mine in Dublin, and uh, we uh, still haven't finished uh, a study we did on trends in Irish attitudes and what might explain those trends from round one to round seven. And what you find in that is, in terms of trying to come up with a kind of an identikit of who is anti-immigrant. Women tend to be more anti-immigrant than men. Older people tend to be more anti-immigrant than young people. Educated, socially liberal, politically left, people with no religion, they tend to be uh, more broad-minded, more favorable to uh, immigration. Uh, being hard up, being financially in some trouble during the crisis, impacted during the economic crisis, and after, but not before. Um, and then uh, unemployment has an, uh, has an effect, but it's not really uh, huge. Um, let me have, make a few remarks about uh, uh, Ireland and uh, its, its uh, attitudes uh, towards uh, asylum seekers. The first thing is that uh, the numbers seeking asylum match the UK experience very closely. And you see that here. Uh, this is setting uh, the year 2000 at 100. And you see there's a bit of a rise. And then the decline mimics almost perfectly what is happening in Britain. And that is because lots of countries adopted very similar anti-asylum uh, policies, making it more difficult uh, around that time. Um, I think what one would have to say about Irish policy towards asylum seekers is that it's pretty tough, um, and the rejection rate uh, during the 2000s was very high. Most people uh, were made wait a long time uh, or were summarily uh, rejected. At the same time, it's also true that once people are accepted, be they asylum seekers or immigrants from afar, the policy is to try and make them very welcome. Um, and uh, you see that in this. Um, I, this is something that is not unique in Ireland, but uh, Ireland has been holding bigger citizenship ceremonies than any other country. You have them in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. But in Ireland, they are so big 
like uh, this isn't, I'm not trying to sound derogatory, but it's almost, they're a bit like a, a, a Mooney wedding ceremony. They're huge, you know, a thousand people in a room and the Minister for Foreign Affairs comes and, and uh, you know, so people are made very, very welcome. The people who uh, come to these ceremonies are not Poles or Lithuanians. They tend to be people from outside the EU for, being, for whom being an Irish citizen is worth more, uh, matters more. Now, There is a particular Irish glitch on this question of uh, asylum. And this concerns a particular group of people. Um, and I suppose the relevant story here is uh, if you go back to uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, the main character, Leopold Bloom, is asked at one point by uh, an anti Semite, um, and um, so what's your country? And Bloom answered, um, Ireland, I was born here, I'm Irish. And the Irish constitution embodied that belief, the 1937 constitution. Anybody born in Ireland was automatically an Irish citizen. Some people began abusing this in the late 1990s. And uh, the stories were anecdotal, there were no numbers. And uh, there were, you know, extreme statements issued by, by certain people that there, there, there was uh, citizenship tourism on a mass scale. And the way this was done, uh, supposedly, was women would arrive from Africa just about to give birth, head straight for the maternity hospital, have their baby, and then they couldn't be sent back because they couldn't be separated from their newborn infants. So there was this, this, this story that there was a scam and Nigerians were particularly um, fingered uh, for doing this. Now, like I say, uh, there were no facts and figures. The masters of the main maternity hospitals in Dublin began to complain. And they say, our facilities are being stretched. And it's true, my daughter was born in the year 2000 in one of these hospitals. And there were a lot of... Um, let's say, African mothers to be your recent African mothers. And this, this is the kind of thing that was being targeted. Now, the result was a referendum on citizenship in 2004, which cut the link that uh, Leopold Bloom uh, thought important. So being born in Ireland was no longer uh, enough. Now, the issue is that, like, this is a Labour Party poster, and the Labour Party said no. And they said, there are no figures. Uh, but I have some figures for you. Uh, and it's important. I mean, information is always worth something. And I got information from one of the maternity hospitals in Dublin. I'm not at liberty to say which one. Uh, but they gave me information on when did women first book a place? They say they become pregnant. And, uh, and in, in, the usual thing in Ireland is you go six or seven months before giving birth, and you say, I'm going to have a child and I need care, antenatal care and so on. So, um, so no, there you go, the normal appointment is like, say, 100, 180 days before birth. So this is the situation in Ireland before the referendum and after the referendum. And it's the same. In fact, in fact, women are giving more notice in recent years than they were in the 1990s. But you can see that the vast majority uh, do not come in as they are about to give birth. But these are the Nigerians. And you can see, obviously, that the, the accusation of, of citizen tour, tourism was, was a valid one. You know, these are people that, for, for their own reasons, they are using a loophole in the law. And then as soon as the referendum is passed and that becomes possible no longer, the pattern changes very, very radically. So in a way, the referendum was necessary because it, 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 this, is, this is something that people who were anti-immigrant in general were using as an excuse. So the issue was a fairly small one in terms of numbers. You're talking about hundreds or low thousands. But there was, like I say, a statistical vacuum and so it was a, something that needed to be uh, pricked and, and dealt with. Um, in round seven of the European Social Survey, 
Uh, there is a question on uh, how liberal people are towards asylum seekers. And this is what you get. Older people, women, people... This is true both in Ireland and in Europe. Uh, this is an interesting one. There is a question in round seven. Are you afraid of going out at night alone? And people who are not afraid, they are more supportive. Not being religious, being satisfied with life, saying they're happy. So these are the kind of variables that are highly correlated, if you like, with uh, a positive attitude uh, towards uh, immigrants. Xenophobia is strongly... So people who say we want no Jews, they also don't want uh, asylum seekers. Interestingly here, um, women are more supportive of asylum seekers, where they tend to be less supportive of immigrants. And that, that is something that is maybe worth thinking about and, and, and studying a bit more. Um, now, I want to talk, I don't have too much more time left, but I... I good. Uh, one thing uh, we dwell on in the paper, and again, if anybody wants a copy, just drop me a line and I'll send you the paper. Uh, one thing we, we focus on is this issue of women's attitudes. And of course, there is a big literature in economics about are women different than men in terms of tastes and preferences and what have you. And uh, that literature tells us, there's an argument about it, but uh, a lot of it focuses on women being more risk averse um, and uh, we know that women have different attitudes to politics. For example, in the US, uh, since the 1980s, uh, women are much more likely to vote for the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. Women's attitude to issues of welfare policy, charity, are different. Um, it's also, like I say, true that they are more hostile than men to free trade and also to uh, migration. And the issue then is, why is this the case? Um, is it because educated people are more favorably disposed towards migration and asylum, but women are less educated, so that's, that's... Or is it something more inherent? You know, does it have to do with responses or with characteristics or endowments? And the way to answer that question is through a what economists call a blinder Oaxaca uh, decomposition. And what it suggests is that it's not the endowments. Women are different. Women respond differently. You know, the, if you like, the elasticities are different. They somehow uh, respond differently. Uh, okay, so the last thing I want to talk about here is something else that is included in uh, round one of uh, the ESS, but then dropped, and it's now back in round seven. And this is the issue about perceptions. Typically, people think that there are far more migrants in the country than there really are. And this is particularly true a few years ago. I was doing some work with uh, Matteo Gomellini, who works in the Bank of Italy, on Italian immigration. And this is particularly true when it comes to illegal immigration. People have some kind of... It's a bit like what Doug Massey was saying about the border. People think all the immigrants are illegal, whereas in fact only a small fraction are. But anyway, what I'm interested in here is perceptions about the proportion of the population that are immigrants. And you can see the question is there in blue. And you can see this is, this is how it is. Uh, you can, you, you can plot the actual proportion bo uh, born abroad with the perceived proportion born abroad. And it's always above the 45 degree line. Uh, and you can do it, this is another way of doing the same things, but this is comparing men and women, where zero is male and one is female. And an interesting thing here is that people have an exaggerated perception, but nearly in nearly all countries, women exaggerate more than men. Um, yeah. So then you can ask what else affects this issue of perception? Poorly educated people are more likely uh, to exaggerate. People who are on the right 
people who are xenophobic are more likely to exaggerate. People who are unhappy in their personal life or who are unhappy about their politicians or who are unhealthy, they also are more likely to uh, exaggerate. And uh, people who believe that immigration is not culturally enriching, they also are inclined to uh, exaggerate. Now, again, this raises the issue, why are women more likely to exaggerate than men? And we do a blind or a half out again. Is it because uh, it's, it's, it's something inherent? Or is it because, like I say, uh, women are less educated or they're older or whatever? And uh, the answer is that it's women's responses who are different. There's something, it's a bit like in the literature, women are more risk averse, it seems here. They are more likely, uh, as far as we can see, to um, exaggerate the issue. So the paper has been a bit, a bit scattered, a bit about Ireland, but then Ireland comparing uh, Ireland to Europe and uh, looking at how women are different uh, to men. And what we find is uh, that Irish attitudes have evolved, that the Irish are softer uh, on uh, asylum than on migration, just as women are softer on asylum than on migration. That asylum was exploited in Ireland in the past, that there are these um, uh, important gender differences. And I, I, like, I think the more we know, the better, even from a small country uh, like Ireland. So thanks a lot. <laughs>